So tortoise git is uh, it's integrated in to the file explorer. Therefore, it doesn't show that it's running. If you want to see if it's running or not, open, a, open the file explorer, right click on an empty area, and you will see there are options showing tortoise in it. That means your tortoise kit is actually active. Number two, if Visual Studio 2019 is not running, let me know so I can come and fix it for you. But uh, uh, stand on the place that it says uh, uh, Visual Studio 2019. I want everybody's Visual Studio 2019 to run, and then we start. Uh, if your computer, if you see any computer beside you that it's off, please turn it on. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. If it doesn't log in. It doesn't, uh-huh. If, I wish I could actually put your computer on the thing. If it happens like that, come on this. Somebody fixed it like this in the other class. Click on Visual Studio, go stop. Yes, and? Now do it. Work. Okay, one more time. So I'll go wrong. Got fixed like that in the other class. Actually, it over here, and they said stop, and it went ready, and then they launched it. I think this is the one. Yeah. No, that's. Is it 2019? Yeah. Yeah. Why is it? There we go. Now it opened. If you see, if you try to start Visual Studio 2019 and it hangs, let me know and I'll come and fix it for you. And Paul, come and see it. Do you know? How? Okay. And if you see a computer beside you, turn it on. The reason is that if something goes wrong, we want to be able to switch to another computer quickly. Oh, shoot, I'm recording. Okay. Is it running? Now that we have the Git and Python Visual Studio running, uh, we need to listen. And there's one thing that I want to ask you. It's very important, extremely important thing in my class. I need you, I mentioned in the other class too, I need you to create a virtual switch in your brain for your vocal cords, which means when I talk, you switch it off, okay? Um, don't talk with each other. The reason is that it's my problem, not yours. It's, I have this psychological problem that when somebody else talks, I get distracted. And then I lose my train of thought and everything goes down to hee haw. Okay? So please, when I talk, don't talk with each other. Listen to me and then you can continue. Believe me, nothing's going to go wrong with that. I, I, I guarantee you. Now, we have Git installed. We have Putty installed. That probably we're not going to use today. If we're lucky, we can go down to the end of uh, Visual Studio 2019, but we're going to have it just in case. Um, first, talking about Git. Um, uh, I just, let me just actually uh, bring it up. First thing we need to do is to clone the uh, The repository, and we are going to talk about it in a second. So, if you go to OOP 2044 NAB notes and you open it um, in GitHub, refresh. So, no, I did not put it up. Let me just push it. Uh, 
Okay, refresh. There you go. You see over here it says 0 to January 10A. That means Section A. That's you. All right? So uh, we need to clone that thing down to your computer. But to understand what cloning is, first I have to give you a quick review of what GitHub is and what Git is. So we, I, I need your attention to understand exactly what we are dealing here with. Okay? Um, you don't need to log, in, log into Putty. You don't need to log into Matrix. When the time comes, we'll do it. So don't worry about it. Okay? Just have the applications running on your computer so when the time comes, we can do this all together. Git is a version control system. A version control system is essentially um, a program that watches over your work and keeps track of all the changes you're making. So when you create a repository, a Git repository, and you work inside of it, not anywhere, inside that repository, any saving and changing and modification you do your code, Git's going to take a note of it and knows exactly what the changes are. For example, I do something to a project. I'll post the project, and a few days later, I'll change something in that project. You update your Git repository with the repository that we have on GitHub, and you don't know what the changes I made. You can simply go to Git, what things are changed, have been changed. Git lists everything for you. This was added, this was removed, this was modified. It tells you exactly what changes were. That's a good thing about read-only stuff that I give you and you get and you don't modify. When you go to get your student package from GitHub, you can create your own, make sure, private repositories, not public. Don't make it public because if your code is public and another student copies it, you're at fault too. Remember that. Okay? So what you do, create your own private repositories, then you can use those repositories to keep your work tracked and up to date all the time. So you don't have to worry about, I lost my memory stick, my hard drive got fried, my computer died, and I lost all my assignment. That's never going to happen to you. Anything goes wrong, you always have a copy on GitHub, and you can always put it down and do whatever you want to do with it. How does Git work? So it, it's a version control. There are certain things that I use for it. I've got to say clone, I say pull, I say push. Pull, push, commit. I use these terminology, and I give you some equivalence to what we do usually in a day. It doesn't mean that it's that. Anything that Git does, does it intelligently. It does it in a kind of a souped up way. Okay, so I will say you clone a repository. That essentially means you download the repository and copy it on your hard drive. It's not only that. Okay, so cloning is essentially downloading, but it creates a repository on your computer. Git is a distributed system. What does it mean? It means Git makes copies, clones of itself everywhere, and easily can sync them with each other. So therefore, the, when you actually clone a repository from GitHub on your computer, your computer's Git repository has identical capabilities of whatever the Git repository on GitHub has. They are identical. They are literally clones. So that's why you don't have to be connected to GitHub. You just clone it, do your work, Commit your work to your local repository, and when you're done, you push the changes up to GitHub. That's uploading, souped up uploading. That's intelligent uploading. When you push something up into a master repository or another repository, it only applies the changes over there. It's not going to upload the whole thing. That's why when you're actually pushing stuff into a repository, the, the real repository is like four gigs. It takes only three seconds. Why? Because it only applies the changes. And then when I put something in, a new thing on a repository on Git, and I tell you, Workshop 2 is published now. You simply go, because yesterday you cloned it on your desktop app. You simply pull, and it only pulls what is added to the repository, so applies the changes. Of course, sometimes you make changes to files 
on your own repository and I make changes to that file on GitHub repository. So I change it, you change it. When you do pull, it comes and takes it. Wait a minute. Then it tries to merge the two changes together. Many times, this is not successful. If this is not successful, that's what we call a conflict. It tells you it's a conflict. I cannot merge the code. When that's the case, you can bring them both up and see what are changes. I say, we can say, I want this line from this one, that line from that one, that one, that one, merge it. Okay? So you can do it yourself, which in our case never is going to happen. <laughs> okay? That's for, you know, high tech stuff that you're doing. What I want to say, tell you is this go again, I mentioned it last time, go to the README file of the notes down here. There is a Git Pro Git book, it's an open free book on internet. Read the first two chapters, and I told you, read the first two chapters, and you know Git more than me. Okay? Read chapter, I think, is five. That is GitHub. It tells you how things work on GitHub. Tortoise Git is a shell for Windows, so essentially you can easily, instead of issuing command lines, you can issue all the commands using your mouse and file explorer. I don't want you to learn Git. This is not a Git class. Git is so complicated that people who worked with it for 10 years can still learn new stuff. It's a very, it's not complicated, it's sophisticated, let's put it that way. You can use it the way you want. You can use it as a beginner to do little stuff with it. And as the time goes by, you can use it better and better with more features and do branching and forking and things like that that have no idea what it is for now and you don't need to know. All right? So. How to set up your computers at home? Go to videos and click on how to playlist. The how to playlist actually has all the steps you need to know to prep your computer what you do. How to install Git. Again, Tortoise Git doesn't have Git in it. It's just a shell, a tool that applies the commands for Git using a GUI interface. So you have to have Git installed. That's there, all of it. It tells you exactly how to do step by step one by one, and shows you little things on how to do commits and things like this. Get basic commands of Git, it demonstrates, you, demonstrates to you how it works. When you are dealing on Git, on GitHub, we are on GitHub right now. There is this little green thing you over here and says clone or, clone or download. You have several options over there dependent, depending if you are logged into Git or not. Make sure you create an account on Git. Make sure you get the student package. Your identity on Git and your work on Git and your knowledge of Git changes the way you're going to get hired when you actually apply for a job. A person who knows how to deal with a repository, even in a basic way, has much, much, much more chance of getting hired than a person who doesn't know. If somebody Googles your name and GitHub comes up, that's a green bulb coming up for the person who wants to hire you. Wow, this guy is not only, no, doesn't, uh, not only knows how to work with Git, but is active on a community in some kind of a project. Then they go through your code and take a look at whatever is open, and it's beautiful. Okay, so remember, that little program that you have written to take care of your shopping list, that little game that you have written in some project that you had at Seneca, after you're done, have those things on GitHub and let people see it on demand, okay? You can always add people to your repository. You can collaborate on stuff. You can create a repository on a project, a group project, and add other Git members to it, and five people work on the same repository so you don't get lost who's doing what. Are we good with Git now? It's not, I'm not gonna teach you what Git is, but we're gonna, kind of use it, and by using it, we're going to hopefully get through it. There, are, If you are logged into Git, when you actually go on clone or download, you will see two options, use SSH or use HTTPS. Use SSH means you have a shared key between you and GitHub. What is a key? SSH, everybody thinks that SSH is a terminal client. S SSH is not a terminal client. SSH is a protocol with which a terminal client can connect to a server. Okay? It's a secure way to talk to another server. If you use SSH to do so, it means you have to generate a key on your computer 
and upload the same key on GitHub and it have it present on your computer so when you want to upload, push or pull or clone or whatever, it negotiates it, checks it. Is the key the same? Yes, this person is authenticated, passes you through. If you don't have that key and use HTTPS, then every single time you have to authenticate if the repository is private. If the repository is not private and open like my notes over here, you can simply clone it. Of course, you cannot push anything up to it. And I don't want you to because you're going to ruin my work. Okay? I'm just allowing you to get stuff. So, if you get my code and you modify something in there, and then I change something, and then you try to get updates from my notes and you see there is a conflict, what you do? You can try to fix the conflict, but the easiest way is always to create a temporary directory, copy the direct repository you created into that temp, reclone everything, and add your files and delete the old one. That's the easiest way for us to resolve conflicts. Okay? You don't have to actually go through conflict, fixing a conflict for now. So, I created that directory over there. So now together, we are going to clone that one on your computer. When I give you instructions, I know you are much smarter than me, but please follow my steps one by one. One of the things that students are by default, no matter how old you are, how experienced you are, two things actually students become. They procrastinate and they are sloppy. These are the two things that every student is on planet Earth. It's impossible for you not to be. I put my butt on that chair and I'll be the exact same thing. No difference. So please follow the steps exactly as I tell you. Okay? <clears throat> know where your work is. That's the very first thing you need to know. When you see something is being saved on your computer, just, just click on that save thingy. And then you're going to have end up with 95 million things on your desktop in the same directory. And I bet if I go to your notebooks right now, you are exactly the same now. Make sure you know where you save something and you have a special place for it. On these computers, the base place is drive temp, D. That's an empty drive, virtual drive they create on these computers. It has nothing on it. So you don't worry about my work is being mixed up with anything. On drive D, if you open the computer, is anything on it? Completely delete everything on drive D, on the computers at, at Seneca College. And create your work over there so you're not sloppy and you have everything over there exactly as exactly how you need it. So how do we deal with this thing? Number one, click on clone and download. Make sure in here it says clone with, H with HTTPS. Verify that. Do it right now. Okay? After you do that, you have to copy this URL into Clipboard. There are two ways of doing that. Either you click on it, it gets blue, right click and you go copy, or you simply click on the button at right. When you click at the button at right, it doesn't give you any message that it got copied or whatever. So your choice, either click over here or click over here. When it gets full blue, right click and say copy. After you do that, after you do that, give me a second. I want to prepare something before I continue. After you do that, open up your explorer, go to drive D. On drive D, I created a temp directory. Your drive D is already D. There you don't need to create a directory in it. Because my drive D is my data file, data hard drive, I created a temp directory. So your drive D should be empty. Anywhere on that empty area, right click and click on, on clone. You're not on a, that was it. No. Did you go to the, did you copy the URL or not yet? Okay. Yeah. So again, let me tell you one more time. Right click on the empty area and select git clone. And don't do anything else. Stop right there. Okay? So right click and hit git clone. 
when you click on get clone, you should have what you had in the uh, clipboard appear over there highlighted with blue. If you don't have that blue thingy, it means you did not click uh, copy the URL. Oh, you already did that. OK. All right. And then you can click on OK. So if you have that blue thingy, you click on OK. And as soon as you see the directory created, it says success. Then after that, you have a clone of the repository on Git on your computer. Just click on OK. So now you have the identical thing that you had on over there. So if I click on OK, I just, I'm just emphasizing you should have this thing over here. It pastes it automatically. You don't need to do it. OK? So now you click on OK, and you're going to have everything over there set. So I'm going to click on OK. All right. And in here, if you go to 02 January 10A, you will see it says cenograph.cpp. Do not open it. I know you have a desire to open it, but open the, this is last semester's workshop. We're going to demonstrate things on it. I'm going to post the workshop probably tonight. So you're going to see the workshop coming out, and you're going to start working on it. And next Friday is your workshop one. OK? So if anybody, have not, is, is, if anybody over here doesn't have that repository cloned, raise your hand, and we're going to come to you to help you do it. I'm going to come to you in a second. Let me pause this. Now that we have the repository over here, we're going to use the file that we have in a repository. Uh, we're going to create together an empty application, put the file in it, start editing it, go through walkthroughs and everything, and see how everything works, OK? So step number one, have Visual Studio open and ready. Don't click on anything. Just wait for me on the first page that says create a project, OK? Then click on create a new project. And through the applications that you have over here, look for empty project that only has C++, Windows, and console, and nothing else, OK? Empty project, C++, Windows, console. That's our friend. When you select that one, as you see, it's going to put it in a recent one anyway. So then if you're on your laptop, the next time you can just go to the recent project and select that one. Or if you're at school, make sure it's empty project, C++, Windows console. Not C++, Windows console library, C++, Windows and console only. Then you click on Next. Now in location, select the column backslash. Location is where you're going to put your, uh, your uh, code. Now if you're on your own computer, select directory that you have designated for OP244. If you're working at school computers, always go to the D, direct, D, D, D hard drive because that's empty and ready for you and blank for you so you don't... You have no idea how many times I had students having three copies of the same thing and working on the wrong copy calling me that no matter what I change, my program like, runs like before. Okay? Make sure you don't have five copies of something. All right? Just use an empty place that there is nothing else so you can actually work it. After doing that, make sure that this check mark is checked. Place, solution, and project in the same directory. You want that always to be checked in OOP244. For project name, we're going to put WS00 because it is actually workshop 0, not workshop 1. Workshop 1 is next week. Okay? WS00. So it has to be on location D. Don't just put it anywhere. I don't want to come over there and then see it's in some document directory deep in some place on your hard drive. Okay? Drive D and then click on create. And three years later, you're going to see Visual Studio coming up with a few things for you. And then I'm going to come to your desk. I always like to have my things clean around me. I don't want to have too many things around my desk to be able to work, do stuff properly. 
Look at the Visual Studio that I just got open. At right side, where it says Admin at top, you have four tabs. Server Explorer, Toolbox, Notifications, Properties. Close them all. You don't need them. Close them all. At left side, under your Solution Explorer, there are four tabs. Property, Team, Class, and Solution. Class is a good thing. Keep it. Because later on when you're actually developing something, it shows you the hierarchy of the classes you created. That's good for your health. But Properties and Team Explorer, get rid of it. You don't need it. Close it. Close all these. Click on them. No, no. Close it. Click on it. <laughs> and then close it. OK. The other. Yeah. So first click on a tab. When it gets activated, close it. You don't want to have those things around you. So essentially, the only thing I have over here is Solution Explorer and Class View. If you close Solution Explorer by mistake, it's not the end of the world. Click on View. The first one is Solution Explorer and comes back right up. And that's where everything begins. Do you have your Solution Explorer active, ready to go? Anyone who needs help? All right. The very first thing you need to know is where the heck my files are supposed to be on a hard drive. Whenever you have any doubt on what you are dealing with and what you're copying or what you're doing, right click at the, on the name of the project and select open, uh, open in Solution Explorer or, something, or File Explorer. So right click on your solution name, open folder in File Explorer, click on that one. That's where your files are. Okay? That's where your files are. Now, I need to warn you about something. There is something, I don't think it's a, I don't know if it's a bug or not, but it's something that was, like, I, by mistake, I posted solution of workshops last, last semester. And how did that happen? I'll just let you know. When you have your solution created like that, okay, and you have the files of your solution open on Visual Studio, if you go and copy all the files from your Solution Explorer somewhere else with the files open, when you go to the copy and open, it actually edits the original, <laughs> not this one. So make sure if you want to copy the whole directory and move it here or there, close everything. Make sure no file is open. And then close Visual Studio, and then copy the directory. Okay, this is, I learned it the hard way. I had to do the workshop three times because I kept posting the solution. Everyone was telling me, why you're putting the solution up? That's the reason. I thought that I deleted the files, but I didn't because I was deleting somewhere else. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, now that we know where these things are, go to 0 to January 10th directory B, copy cenograph.cpp and paste it right over here and wait for me. So, if you are in drive D, then there is no problem. Just click on drive D and go to the neighboring directory. Go to 02, right click on Senecraft, CPP, copy, go back to the directory you were, and paste it right over there. What files are needed when you are copying your solution from one place to another? If you want to put it on a memory stick and bring it to the school. What files do you bring it? Bring with you. If you want to post, if you create your private repository on GitHub and you want to put the stuff on GitHub so you can come to school, work on it, and have the things distributed. If you want to do something like that, what files are needed in our level to put things up or, or, or bring our solution, move our solution around? This is what you need project.vcxproj project.vcxproj filters and your source files, C and CPP and header files. Those are the only things you need. The rest, directories, whatever you have, they're all garbage. They get recreated every single time you're compiling your code. 
So if you just, like you want to put something on matrix, I've seen people copying the whole solution on matrix. And they put their Windows executables on matrix and say, I ran out of coda. Of course you ran out of coda, because you're putting binary stuff in your files. Don't put garbage stuff. Be aware of what is needed and do it like that. Be obsessive about these things. You have to have a little bit of OCD when you are programming. And I'm not kidding. Be obsessed. Have obsessive compulsive disorder when you are programming. Be obsessed with your code. Make sure you follow the rules obsessively. That's what a good programmer does. If you write sloppy code, it's going to come and haunt you seven years later and ruin your life. I guarantee that. OK? Be extremely careful. What I mean is that you write a code, you're sloppy, your code works now, you think everything's good, you give it to the client, you go. Seven years later, your program crashes, you have to go back, edit the sloppy code you have written seven years ago because you have a warranty on your code. Don't. Careful, okay? Of course, if you're working for a company, they're going to give you a 500-page, 1,000-page manual of what the coding regulations are. And if you miss a dot, they won't submit your code at all, as if you haven't written anything. Okay, extremely important. These are all, that's why I'm being so obsessive and I'm saying, you have to do it like this, I want you to do it like that. I want you to learn how to follow rules of a company. It's not that I'm a beep, it's just I want to make sure that you actually do the work properly. Okay, so now that we have the beautiful Cenograph over here, we have to add it to our solution. So what we do, we click on Visual Studio, we right click on Source Files, and we click on Add Existing Items. Anytime you are doing something, look at the right side. What does it say? Shift Alt A. These shortcut keys are your friend. Adding file to a solution is not something that you're going to do so many times. So having a shortcut key for that probably is not very useful. But when you are dealing with things like compilation and debugging, knowing shortcut keys for it saves lots of time. You don't have to keep going to menus and stuff like that and keep doing it things over and over. So add existing items, item, and select Cenograph. And click on Add. If you go back to the directory of the solution, you will see Cenograph is here and it's there. But there is no directory called source files. Those are virtual directories. Those directories are organization of Visual Studio, and they are kept in vcxproj.filters. So there is no directory anywhere. Those organization and organizing the code, they're all done within the Visual C++ application to make it look as if they are in a subdirectory. They are not. <clears throat> and because of that fact, C++, Visual Studio, not C++, doesn't show the full path of Cenograph over here. So if you do that silly mistake, I'm not going to say stupid because it's not right, that silly mistake to go to another directory and add that one to your solution, it's just going to show Cenograph. But the file is actually in some other directory outside of your solution. You think you are working on a file here, but the file is far somewhere else. And then you submit your code and you see that, that nothing is there. Why? Because you are sloppy. You did not do the things the way they are supposed to be. <clears throat> so the Cenograph is there. Now we want to see how we can actually deal with this thing, run and compile and run it. As we talked about last time, there are several stages of compilation. You just, just compile the code. When you write that little compile code, several things happen. First, individual modules of your program get compiled to object files. And after that, those object files, if everything's good and nice and dandy, those object files get merged and linked into an executable. And all promises that you... I didn't mention this in class, didn't I? I didn't mention this in class? I'm a bad boy. I'll do it now. <coughs> so. When you are compiling a code, I thought I, I, I did, but uh, probably I did it in three, four, five by mistake. I thought I did it here. So give me two seconds. Sometimes students' faces are the best feedback. Uh, 
Two seconds. There you go. Just a second. Let me pause this. So how compiler works? Do we have anyone over here who has problem with colors? No, we are good? Oh, surprise. OK. All right. So I have written a project, and it has several modules in it. It has blue module.cpp, red module.cpp, green module.cpp, and it has a main module.cpp over there. When you compile the code, what happens is that for every single module that you have, C or CPP file, compiler runs separately. So compiler actually runs four times. One, two, three, four. First, it compiles the blue one and creates an object file over here. Then creates the red one. If there are no syntax error, creates an object file. Then does the green object file does the brown object file. If there are no problems, then it links them together in one executable. Now, why this process happens? Let's say in your module, you have done this in IPC 144. In one module, you are including the header file of another module, and you're using the functions there. Those functions are not present over here, but they are being used. So the source code of the functions are in red object but the callings are in brown object. That's the linker's responsibility. Promises made are actually kept. So whenever you see it says this function is not found, that function is not found, it means you promise the function exists in some place, but you didn't provide the, the, the body for it. So number one, number two, number three, number four, and then it links and it gets executed. I'll go through the header, headers, inclusions, and all the stuff like that later on. OK? Now, so essentially, what you would like to do is to be able to compile this, which means only compile, only do this part. Only do this part. So create the blue one. I don't want an executable. I just want to see if my code has a proper syntax. I don't want it to see if it's run, running. I want to see if I have a syntax error over there, something silly that it's wrong. If I see if I have any warnings over there. To do that, right click on the name of the file, and you'll see there is a compile option. Shortcut key for it, Control F7. Control F7 is your friend. As you are writing a code and completing each function, you should keep doing Control F7. Compile, compile. Just compile my code so I can, if there is any problem, I'll fix it now. Don't write the whole code to the end and then compile and see 95,000 errors over there. Always fix it as you go. Module by module, function by function, keep going, test, 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 get the compilers away, and then you're fine. So if I right click and compile over here, or I press Control F7, it actually compiles the code and tells me it is successful with no warnings. If I go to the directory, I see there is a debug directory now. And if I look over there, there is a WS, there is a senagraph.obj now. That's the object file. That's the thing that is, that's the binary representation, machine language representation of your C language. But it's still not executable. It is not linked to the libraries that you include it. Things that you, like printfs and scanfs and all those things that you have in standard library. You made a call for it, but it's not linked to it yet. It doesn't have the body to it in it yet. As soon as you do the, ex, the, the full build, which essentially is the compilation, then that's what happens. So now that it's done, I'm going to come over here and go build. I'll go build solutions. So control shift B means build everything and do the executable and all the shebang that it has. If you do it, you'll see that it's, it's going to be very quick because the compilation is already done. Anything that is compiled already, it's not going to get compiled again. That's why if you have a big solution, you download, I don't know, the Chrome browser solution from Google. It's open source, right? And you want to 
fiddle with it and do some changes and make your own version of Chrome. If you want to do that and you want to you, you change a certain piece and you want to compile and see how it works, it's not going to recompile the whole thing. It's just going to compile the place that you change. Therefore, it's going to be very quick. But if you have some problems in linking and you think, I want to rebuild everything from scratch to make sure everything works, then you can do rebuild. Rebuild essentially means compile everything that was compiled, even compiled before. So if I go rebuild, you'll see it actually compiles C the code first and then creates the executable. Okay? Now that I have created this one, I can run my program and test it. But running the program and testing it and just running it are two different things. You can run the program without Visual Studio supervision. That's actually running without debugging. Click on debug, take a look at the op sub options. If you click on debug, you see one of the options says click run without debugging. You see that? And it is called Control F5, correct? If you do that right now, actually press Control F5, you'll see it actually runs your program. It actually runs it like this. To have a taste of it, to see how it works, first press 1 to set the number of samples. So it's a graph program. Let's say we have three samples. Put 3. Now enter the samples into the program. 2. Now put three numbers, say 56, 78, and 23. Whatever. Hit Enter. Now your samples are in. Now you can actually draw the graphs. Three, it actually draws the graph for the values that you put over there. Okay? So that's the program that, got, that created these things. Are we okay with this? All right? Now let's walk through it. I want to see, I want to see how the, I want to see how the samples are received in here. I want to see that. If you want to do that, first let's go zero and exit. So it exits your program and get out. Now, scroll the code down until you find, go to main, go directly to main, right at the bottom. You see there is get samples over there, right? Function get samples at line 151. You see that? Let's assume we have a program that has 50 million lines of code. I want to know where the heck is that function so I can walk through it. Right click on the function and go, go to definition. It jumps to the code, code of the function and shows you where, where the function is. Or you can go to the declaration to see where it's actually declared. So it actually brings you to the function, where the function is written, so we can walk through it. Everybody, please find the function. If you haven't, raise your hand. I'm going to come for help. Did you all find the function? Now, I want you to listen to me. Bring the mouse on the for loop and slowly move it to left. So the mouse is in this direction. As soon as you get to the gray area, you go poop, like that. When it got like that, click. A square, a, a, a red circle is going to appear beside 122. Do that. So bring the mouse on for loop, move it to left side of 122, it changes direction. Click, it becomes red. I want everybody to have that red thingy beside the for loop. You just close the for loop, my friend. Keep going, keep going, keep. Move to the left, move to the left, move to the left, move to the left. Move to the left, move to the left, left. Stop on the gray area. Move to the left, move to the left. Wait, wait. Why do you keep clicking? Move to the left, slowly. Gray area, click. All right. All right. I want everybody to have that red dot over there. You have it? Anyone who doesn't have it? A little bit more. Don't worry, it's not going to hurt you now. Oh, click, no. click, 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 click. There you go. Hey! <laughs> All right, we have the red dot over there. Are we good? All right. Now, last time we pressed Control F5. This time we're going to press F5 only. Press the F5 and don't do anything. Just press F5. 
Okay, it's gonna run the program and you gotta see that menu thingy coming up over there. Wait a minute, I wanna see my code and I want to see the thing at the same time. So what do you do? Grab the top of the code and stick it to the left side of the thing. So bring it over here until it kinda claps it, you see that? Let go. Then it tells you which one to be at right. I want my Visual Studio to be at right. So now I have both of them. Go at the top. Oh, she's a pro. <laughs> okay, so do that, okay? We all have it, right? What's going on? Pardon me? Did you press F5? Yeah. Where's the thing? Here, right? Yeah. Bring it to the left. No, that one right. Okay? Are we okay? Now you can bring your little mouse over here, okay? Now you can bring your mouse over here and kind of drag it left and right to, to kind of adjust it the way you want, and it's just going to adjust it, okay? Oh, sorry, I put it in the wrong one. Okay, there you go. We okay down to here? Are we okay? All right. Now I want you to uh, press 1 and hit uh, 1, and then enter 3, and wait for me. Okay? Are we good? Next step, I want you to enter 2 and hit enter and wait for me. Don't do anything. You see a yellow arrow appears on the red dot. That means the execution is paused at that line and no more it, it runs. So your program is at the pause state now. It's not running anymore. All right? Now, Bring your mouse on debug menu and take a look at the debug menu. Because students keep asking me questions and I want to give you the answer now. There are three options over there that are, that are your friends. You see that? F11, F10, and Shift F11. F11, step into. It means if the pause of execution is happening right beside the function, step into into that function and start walking through that function. If you're 100% sure that that function is, is good and okay, you can press F10. Then it's going to treat that function as a single command and execute the whole thing and go to next line. If by mistake you go into a function and you say, oops, I didn't want to execute this. I want to go back to the next one. You do shift 11. It means execute the whole thing inside this function and get out and wait for me. Now, if while you were installing your Visual Studio, you installed the source code too, if you by mistake press F11 on library stuff, it actually goes and walk through the source code of the compiler for you. That happens. As soon as you see some jumbo mumbo things came up when you're walking through, it means you press F11. Immediately do shift F11 to get out of the code back to your own. Usually when those walkthroughs happen, it goes to the right side like this. But anyways, it's not important. So we are okay down to here, right? Okay, now I want you to click on the thing and close the menu. So remember F11, F10, and shift F11. Bring your mouse on I and it shows you what the, the, the number inside that variable is. What is the number now? What is the number now? It's garbage. We call garbage because it's not initialized. Anybody who can tell me immediately what is that is going to get 10 bucks. <laughs> okay, I'm joking. I don't have 10 bucks. <laughs> it will strike 85 billion. And, okay, so, okay so, so now I want you to press F10. Because I'm not at any function at this moment, F10 and F11 will work the same way. Press F10 for me. As you see, for uh, loop got executed and we got in. If you now hold your mouse on I, you will see that it's zero. So that zero thingy happened. Number of samples are three. So you can verify every single variable's value as you're walking through it to make sure everything's correct and right, nicely entered. If that sample was four right now, it means we had a bug. I had to fix it. All right? Next thing you do, I want you to press F10 on line, not F11. If you press F10, it executes the whole function. As you see, whoop, a line is drawn over here. 
Now, press F10 again. And it's going to print that C out thingy. Now, let me explain what that C out is. I said we're going to have a quiz today on OOP, on, uh, on uh, uh, polymorphism and Schmigli dinghy and all those stuff. Remember that? C does not print its stuff using functions. That's a lie. Of course, underneath there's a function. But uh, superficially, I could say, it doesn't use functions. Okay? It uses an object. So there are two objects in here. What is an object? What is a class? Anybody remember what the class is? We said we, we put everything using polymorphism, encapsulation, and inheritance in a package. We call that package a class. How do we reuse your code? Using inheritance. Remember that? We talked about inheritance. Okay, so when you have a class, you create an instance out of that class, we call that an object. So C out is an instance that represents the console output. That's why we call it C out. So anything you want, it actually represents your, your, your terminal that you print on it. Okay? C in, C I N, is a, a, an object that represents your keyboard, console input. And it's all polymorph, which means if you want to print something like on C out, unlike, unlike C language, you don't have to mention what you are printing. In C language, you have to say percent %d if you are printing an integer. You have to say percent %f if you are printing a double, right? In here, you don't do that. You just use the insertion operator, as you see. You say, I want, to, I want this to be inserted into C out. So a backslash got to go there. Then I want to insert i plus 1 into C out. i plus 1 is an integer. It's going to print an integer. You don't need to mention it. It's polymorph. It has many shapes. Then you say, I want a string. I want to set the width to 2. I want this. So as you see, in a polymorphic way, it's actually printing things out. I don't have to mention anything specific. We don't care about that. We just want to walk through it. Press F10. And you see that thing is going to actually, oh, shoot, I pressed F10 too early. So I'm going to go back. Uh, see? Oh, another thing that I want to show you, that's, and it's actually pretty cool. So I'm here. I'm going to stop the debugging. So I'm going to say debugging, stop. You don't do it. You don't do it. Just look at me. I'm going to stop the debugging. I went one further. I want to go back. So I'm going to take this out, OK? Now I'm going to put it over here. Because I already walked through before this, right? I'm going to put it over there. So it's there now, right in front of C out. Now I'm going to say F5 again. And this time it's going to run and stop right over there. So one, three, and you see, two. And there you go. It stops right at C out. OK? Now I'm going to press F10. And it's going to write stand before go back, and it's going to print what I want it to print. Now, go back is supposed to bring the cursor back over here in front of this. OK? I want to see how it's doing it. So I'm going to press F11 to go inside, go back. Press F11. Now it goes inside back. What is it doing? In a for loop, it's printing end time backslash B. Remember backslash B was backspace? It's essentially pushing the backspace n times and going back to the place where it's supposed to go. OK? So, and if I want to run it, now I, I'm here. Oops, I didn't want to come in here. Press Shift F11. It executes the whole thing and goes back up. And as you see, the cursor is moved back over here now. Why did I do that? Because I want to have that little thing printed at the right side. You can't do that. When you are printing over there, you cannot print anything after, right? So first I printed that, then I came back and I, and I printed the, the, the thing after. OK? A cute thing to do. Are we OK down to here? All right. Now, let's press F11, uh, F10 again. OK? Now let's press F10 again. And that's going to run get, get int. And now I can enter an integer. I'll put over here 30. And I hit Enter. So it's run the whole thing, and it goes out. Now, if I actually bring my mouse over samples, it's not going to show the whole array for me. It's just showing me one thing over here, right? 
if you want to see the value like that, then it's going to show you 30. If you want to see what the index is, bring it on index, on i, then it's going to show 0. So as you see, you can check every single thing that you have. Now press F10 again. It goes back up at the beginning of the loop. Now bring the mouse on i, and i is 1. So as you see, it is walking through for you step by step. So anytime you have any problem, this is how you walk through everything. Now let's say everything is done, and I want to run the whole thing. OK? I want you to do this. First, remove that red circle by clicking on it. It toggles. It removes it. Now, if I just run and continue to the end, it's going to go. And because I am debugging it, at the end, it's not going to keep anything open. The console will be, will be closed. If that's the case, what you need to do, you need to come down to main right at the last line of main, put a dot right beside return statement. So at the end of main, you're going to stop. Current Visual Studio actually keeps it open. But sometimes, especially when you are doing the real workshop one, it's going to go away. So you have to do this to be able to debug and see how things run in it. OK? So that's that one. And after you do this, now you can press F5 again. It means continue the execution. Press F5 again. Now I go back over there. I can put 20, 10, and then go 1 to show the uh, 3 to show the graph. And of course, it's going to be garbage because I changed the size of the screen. But if I do like this, it's going to be better. There you go. Now I'm going to go 0, and it goes out. And as soon as it goes out, again, this is going to go yellow, which means the execution stops over there. Now, if you want to stop everything and be done with it, either you click on this stop, or you can go to debugging and stop debugging. Shift F5 does the same thing. And that stops the debugging, and the debugging is officially over. Are we OK with this? This is a very simple and quick way of telling you how to debug with Visual Studio. Now I'm recording this. I'm going to put it over YouTube so you can go through it again and see how it works if you forgot any part of it. But do it like this. And you've got to do this from now to the day you die. That's what you're going to do all the time, every time you're writing a program. And this is not only Visual Studio. Any IDE does that. It's one of the features of any integrated development environment. If you are using CodeLight, if you're using Eclipse, if any type of integrated visual, uh, uh, development environment provides some kind of a thing. One of them does F7 to go to the next step. The other one does F10 to go. So you have to just see which shortcut is used for what, and you can use it. Any questions down to here? Yes, sir. Okay. I can't hear you. Definitely, my, the microphone cannot either. So, what was the question? How do you make it uh, generate walkthrough tables? It doesn't generate walkthrough tables. What do you mean about tables? I mean, to draw a table and put the variables over there one by one? Yeah. You can, what you can do, you can add watches. Add watches doesn't create the history of what the values in a variable was but it tells you what is the latest value and what was it before. That's all it does. So if you right click on any variable while it's actually, just go on any variable and right click on it, there is something called add watch. If you do that, it adds it to a watch table underneath so I actually see what's in there. So you can actually go right click on, let's say done, and I'm gonna say add watch. Where is add watch? Uh, Probably it's while you were executing. Let me just see. Done. Add watch. So now let me run it. I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna do a debugging and see. So if you just press F10 at the beginning, it it starts the program and stops right at the beginning. Let's say I want to see what I have in number of samples. I right click over here and I'm gonna go add watch. You see that? If you do add watch, it adds it to a watch window. And you can have that window open at the bottom 
and then that's going to be kind of your walkthrough table, if you, if you may call, if you want to call it that. So that's watch, and if you can just uh, put it over there so it stays over there, number of samples is one. Is that what you were asking? Oh, there you go. So add watch, and then you go through it so it shows you what the latest value. And it tells, so you can actually bring the type over here like that. So you can actually bring it over, so it tells you its type and the value like that. And as soon as the value changes over there, it actually uh, gives you a message for it. So let's say I'm going to come over here and I'm going to uh, execute down to this, that point. So in here I'm going to say get number of samples. I'm going to put one, get number of samples. And in here I'm going to put, so now it actually stands right before it. And as you see, number of samples change to zero. You see that? And it's red. When it's red, it means it's changed. It's kind of flags that the value is changed now. Now that the value is changed, uh, uh, I'm going to do, do an F10. Now it actually runs the function. I'm going to put over there 20 and hit enter. Now as you see, number of value is 20, so it actually tells me well, it's, got, it's got 20. You can always manually add something over here too. So you can actually add over here, and I'm going to type done. And if I do that, now done is added, it's false, and it's Boolean. So you can add a table like that too. I never use it because you, you hover your mouse, it shows you exactly what it is. I think that's redundant and uh, 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 uses my real estate. No, no, there's no, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. You're asking for too much. <laughs> how, can I, how can I make it write the program for me and just <laughs> sit at home and have beer? You can't do that. But, uh, I, and if it's possible, I don't know how. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Anything is possible. All right. So let me stop that. And, uh, and if anybody's uh, watching this video and knows how to do it, please add it to the comments. <laughs> All right. All right, so that's that. Uh, are we good? What's the time? When does the class end? 35. 35? Holy schmoly. No break today. <clears throat> OK. How do we create modules out of this thing? So <clears throat> first thing first, let's close this one and maximize the size of the window so we can see what are we dealing with. OK. Now. <clears throat> A module essentially means a file and a header file that contain the functions or classes that are relative to each other. So we don't have anything in it, everything sitting in a center graph thingy. And these modules are very useful. Like, uh, for example, most of the things that I submitted has a file called tools.cpp. Tools are essentially general tools that you write to do stuff with. So if I want to do something like that, I'm going to right click first on header files, and I want you to do that with me. Right click on header files, click add, new item, at left side use C++ code, and select header file. And then in header, type utils.h. Remember, Windows is not case sensitive, Linux is. If you don't do this, if you don't do the case sensitivity properly, when you move these things into Linux, you're going to be in trouble. And renaming in Windows is not an easy thing. You have to first rename it to something else and rename it to the one with the correct case, case settings. So if your utils is lowercase utils, you cannot directly change it to uppercase utils because it cannot distinguish the difference. You have to first rename it to say utils underline then change it back to capital utils and then remove the underline. Okay? So add that one. When you do something like this, you're going to see it's going to create a, uh, a file for you and add pragma once over there. Pragma once is not fully supported everywhere. So I don't want you to use only that. If I were you, I would just remove it. Or you can just let it be. It doesn't make any difference. These are the rules and regulations of writing code in this class and I want you to always follow it. What you do, you write the phrase if not defined, if NDF, DEF, and then you write SDDS all capital, underline, you write the name of the file all capital, utils, underline, 
the header file dot h and two underlines. That's my regulations for this class, and you have to follow it right down to the end of the semester. Any header file that you create must have this one. Then the second line, create a, a, a line called define. In define, you copy the exact same thing. Don't retype it. If you make a mistake in spelling, you'll be in trouble. Make sure you copy and paste it. And then at the end, you said end if. What I just wrote, the lines that you write with hashtag is another programming language. It is not C++. It is C++, but it's a sub-language in C++. It's a language that you are dealing with, with compiler with. You're actually telling the compiler how to compile your code. These lines of code execute before compilation. So they only run when it gets compiled. When your program is getting executed, there are no such far run, those things. They are all already done and set with. You're essentially telling to the compiler what to do. In this case, I'm telling if that phrase, SDDS underline utils underline H underline underline, is not defined, continue compilation. In the next level of compilation, it is defining that value, correct? And then it compiles the rest of it and it's done. If anybody by mistake includes this header file twice, the second file, the file is being compiled, line number two gets executed by compiler. If not define that phrase, but it's defined already because it was included before, correct? Because of that fact, everything that is in there will be skipped and not compiled. Therefore, anything right in there is impossible to get included twice. That we call compilation safeguards. You must have it in every header file. What you see, ladies and gentlemen, is an empty header file. You are not allowed to have a header file without these code in it. So when you create a header file with your Eyes closed, you must add this to it. Now you can think, what am I supposed to do? We write all our code in a namespace called SDDS. What the heck is a namespace? We don't care at this point. We'll just create it. Any code that you write, apart from the code that is written in the main file, the file that has the main function in it, any other file that you create, except the one that has the main function in it, will have, so we'll, the code will be surrounded in what we call a namespace, and that namespace is called SDDS. So namespace SDDS, and everything is going to get written in there. Now that I have created my header file, I will create my CPP file. The file, that, the file that holds the logic for this header file. Save this, right click on sor source files, uh, sorry, source files, add new item, and in there select C file and type utils with capital uh, uh, U dot CPP and hit enter. Okay? So create a blank file called utils.cpp that is going to be in your source files. Immediately in this source files, include utils.h with single quote. Immediately include utils.h with single quote. Immediately under the include utils.h, Add the namespace again. Remember, namespace is always there except the file that has main in it. Everywhere else. So in here, I'm going to say namespace SDDS. What is a namespace? A namespace is essentially a space for names. Why we are doing this? The programming and creating applications are becoming so vast that we are literally short in names. Let's say I want to create a company that deals with cars. And that company has a car dealership that sells cars, another place that it repairs cars, and another place that it paints cars. So if I want to develop an application that has an entity called car that it's supposed to get painted, my view for that car is completely different with a car that is supposed to be sold. If I'm selling the car, I need to know what is the uh, 
price for it, how can I lease it, and all those things, what is the down payment, stuff like that. When I want to paint the car, I need to know what is the damage, I need to know what kind of a paint I want to use. Completely different ballgame. But they are both dealing with cars. So I cannot create an entity car twice because there's going to be a collision between the names. What happens? I'm going to tell to the programmer who's writing for the paint shop department to write all its code in a namespace called paint shop. And I'm going to tell to the sales department to, that the programmer who writes the code for the sales department to write its code on their namespace, namespace sales. Therefore, the two cars will be paint shop car and sales car. No conflict. That's what namespace does. Now, namespace wasn't there before. It's something new. When I say new, I mean like 20 years, okay? It, it is something new, okay? So, what happens to the old stuff that we had in C++? All the standard stuff that comes with C++. They are all written under a namespace called STD, standing for standard. So everything we had already in C++, they are all in the namespace STD. If you are writing any code that is using those standard stuff, you must tell to the compiler, hey, I am, I am, I am using namespace STD. Now I'm writing a utils module, right? So I'm going to include that utils in here. utils in here and I'm making sure that in here I am using namespace SDDS. In main you use a namespace everywhere else you create it and namespaces are like two bubbles that merge and form a bigger bubble. Two namespaces don't merge, don't uh, conflict if they, are, they have the same name, they merge and they make a bigger namespace. So if you have several namespaces in different files, don't worry if you're doing the same name, they're all going to merge together and becomes, become the same. And because all our code is written in the SDDS department, that's why we, are cho we chose that name. Okay? Now we are ready to actually put stuff in our module. How do we put stuff in our module? <coughs> It's utils, right? The very first function over here is get int. Get int can be used for any application receiving an integer. Therefore, I'm going to remove it out of Cenograph. I'm going to just control exit, cut it, go to utils.cpp, put the source code over there. That is get int like that. Oh, I have seen and see out. Seen and see out is using IO stream. I'm going to include it up there. Remember, Includes only happen where you use something. Never indirectly include anything. Never put an include in a header file and say, I'm not going to include it because it's included in that header file that is included in the other header file. Don't do that. Always have your includes where they are actually needed. So include, I'm going to say IO stream, and IO stream is the, is the header file in which I have all the stuff for input and output streams. And in C++, we don't put any .h for our library stuff. It is in the library, it doesn't have .h. So include IO stream, and immediately after that, I'm going to say using namespace std. And therefore, C in and C out now will have a meaning. Now that I have the get int added to utils.cpp, I have to make sure I'll be able to introduce it to everyone. Therefore, the header file goes, the, the prototype goes into the header file. I'll copy only the name of the function with the comment at the beginning, and I'll put it in a header file. A very good practice and a semicolon after. A very good practice when you are creating a module is to make sure you see them both as you are working. So go to the window, click on new vertical tab, and that's going to separate it into two. So at left side you have the CPP, at right side you have the header file. In IPC144, 
they told us that the names of the variables are formality. We don't need to have them. So let's remove them. No, never remove them, ever, ever. What the heck is that thing? Yet int, 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 int. How does it, how can you say from that what is the first int and what is the second int? It's a formality. Take advantage of it. Write meaningful stuff so six years from now when you look at the prototype, you know what the damn thing does. Don't leave it like that ever. I have seen profs do that in their assignments. They write stuff like that. That's a crime. Don't do it. Use your, use your tools. In here, not only write, not write mean and max, I'm going to say min, number, acceptable. And in here, I'm going to say max, number, acceptable. I not only don't remove it, but also make it more meaningful. So if later I'm going to look at my prototype, I can see what this function does just by the prototype of the function. And that's it. I just added one function to the module, and if I look at my program, it's going to work exactly like it did before with absolutely no problem. <clears throat> I don't have get int over here, but I do have it in utils header file. If I run the program, it runs perfectly, as if it is in the same file. So, and it runs over here, as you see. So we can do all these things over and over. <clears throat> Every single thing that belongs to utils, it's got to go in there. For example, go back. Definitely, that's not a center graph thing. It has something to do with the uh, utilities, right? So I'm going to take that out, put it in utils.cpp, another function, and add the prototype in here. <clears throat> and I'm going to say, go back number of characters, number of cars to go back. Am I loud and clear? All right. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> in the workshop that I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a major file like this, exactly like this. And I'm going to tell you what modules I want because you have to submit them to me. But I'm not going to tell you which, files, which function is going to go where or how to create it. It's completely open-ended. So be the judge yourself. Create something, OK? And if you think there is a module, listen to me carefully. If you think there is a module and it doesn't need any files in it, leave it empty. An empty file compiles just fine. Just make sure your header file is the way I, I asked you to be. <clears throat> so if I told you create, like I gave you a file, I don't know, schmigglydindy.cpp. Just put it over there and add .h to it. And don't put anything in it. Why? Because maybe there's nothing really needs to be there. It's your perspective and your judgment on that. Of course, if you just leave everything empty and give the assignment as is, I'll give you a zero. So don't do that, OK? I know you know that I could just leave the utils empty over here, leave everything as is, and compile it, and everything worked, right? It has to get modularized. But use your own judgment to do it, OK? Um, in future, probably I'm going to have the file utils.h everywhere in case you have something custom yourself that you want to add to your project. OK? You want to have an extra class that you want to have. Or, or add something like extras.cpp and extras.h. I don't know. I'm going to add something. If you want to add something that I, because lots of people want to do custom stuff, and this semester is all about that. Everything is do it yourself. I'm not going to dictate you what to do. The only thing that you're going to be dictated is from lab two to lab nine, workshop two to nine, the lab sections. The do-it-yourself part is completely do-it-yourself. I was just going to tell you to do something, what the file names are, and go do it. OK? And that's it. Any questions? I'm going to complete this thing and put all the files over there so you can see. OK? I'm going to put the module over there with the solution and everything so we can open up the solution. So I'm going to call it WS00. So you're going to have a WS00 with all the files in there. Pull the repository, clone it. Open it and see how it works, and everything's going to be fine. Any questions down to here?
I have one minute. Yes. Is there attendance today? No attendance today, but attendance is going to start from next week. So next week, because this is not a lab, this is just a lecture thingy, right? If you don't have your attendance, your labs are zero. Remember that. You have to come to the lab. The friends that I see, they are not here. I actually see a couple of people who are not here. If you see your friends, tell them you don't come to lab, you get zero. Submissions are not done from the lab, but you have to do your attendance from the lab, from the one of the computers. So make sure you come to lab. The very first thing you do, you open only one terminal client, not two, because if it's two, it won't allow you. It has to be one terminal. Open one putty client from there, do an attendance, close, you're free. If you have done with your lab, go. Okay? But I urge you to stay. If you have done your lab, stay and help others. Help Paul. Have a beautiful day. Huh? No, no, I'm, I'm going to close it, yeah. The video is going to get uploaded. Everything's going to be fine. I'm just going to...